All right, guys, I do believe we are live, finally. Welcome to the very first live Break the Rules in New York City, all the way live from Dime Square. I am your host, Lev Polyakov, and we are here today with the great and powerful Jason Riza Giorgiani, the great philosopher himself. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Great to be with you, Lev, thank you. And uh, before we start, once again, for all the people on YouTube who are watching this, all of your chats are going to be seen on that screen that you are not seeing in the camera, but believe me, there is a large monitor which the audience can see and they're gonna read whatever you write. That's number one. Number two, we are gonna be taking super chats that we're gonna be talking about at the end of the uh, program. And uh, number three, be sure to smash that subscribe button, smash the like button, smash the bell. That is extremely important for the sake of growth. And uh, yeah, and let's, uh, let's have fun. We're gonna be talking today about UFOs, aliens, philosophy, religion, artificial intelligence, all that good stuff. And of course, if you want to support this further, including all the wonderful people who made it out here, be sure to become a patron, patreon.com slash break the rules, and you are going to get VIP access like the lucky few have uh, done today to these kind of events where you can hobnob with the uh, greats like uh, uh, Dr. Giorgiani over here. And uh, yeah, so let us go to the man himself, the man of the hour, hour and a half. Uh, Jason, you have um, written many books that have uh, personally challenged my view of uh, looking at reality, as I'm sure it has uh, for a lot of the people who are here today. Uh, out of all the things that you've written about, it's hard to choose which one is my favorite, but I'm definitely right now in the mood for knowing more about what's beyond our current grasp of understanding when it comes to extra extraterrestrial life, interdimensional entities, things of that nature. And most recently, both of us were watching the uh, conference that was done yesterday with, again, uh, Neil Grush, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. David Grush. David Grush. I always call him Neil. It's probably Neil Armstrong. But anyway, David Grush, he was uh, on the air once again talking about uh, the, uh, the revelations that he has not personally experienced, but he's been talking with people who have. And uh, what exactly did you grasp from the uh, latest uh, conference? And let's go from there. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here with you in person, Lev. Um, haven't done a live event for a very long time, so. Uh, I think the f most important thing that needs to be said about Grush, just to give my gloss on your characterization there, is that uh, David Grush hasn't just been talking to some people, right? Okay, Grush, uh, received detailed above, well, detailed top secret compartmentalized information from about 40 different sources inside uh, black projects, mostly having to do with reverse engineering what he refers to, I think, somewhat misleadingly as non-human technology. And uh, when Grush presented this information, to the Inspector General of Intelligence, he was backed by some of the top brass in the Pentagon who vouched for uh, both his integrity and the authenticity of you know, what he was presenting to the Inspector General's office. And I mean, frankly, they didn't have to do that because he was so specific that he gave project names and the names of individuals as well as locations where this technology was being held and developed across the country. So, you know, one of the things to bear in mind, and we, you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse, we did a whole show on yeah. this, right? So, you know, I'd like to focus more on the hearing uh, at the House Oversight Committee that we, at least that I watched live yesterday. But uh, just briefly in terms of, of Grush, who I think frankly was the most important person to testify there yesterday of those three individuals. Um, Grush, uh, you know, not only presented this information to the inspector general who came up with the conclusion that it was both urgent and uh, credible, but he also conducted an 11-hour hearing with both the Senate and the House Intelligence Committees. So this hearing yesterday in front of the House Oversight Committee was an open public hearing, and you heard him say at least well, maybe even a dozen times to various people who asked him questions, 
you know, I've presented this information already to the Senate, you know, uh, Intelligence Committee and the House Intelligence Committee in a closed session. And, you know, I can't get into more detail about what you're asking me unless you put us in a skiff, in a secure facility, right? So, but here's the important thing there, is that the so-called Gang of Eight, those members in the Congress from both the Senate and the House, who have uh, high-level security clearances, have already been presented with the full list of names of individuals, names of defense contractors, and locations of facilities where this technology is being held or where crash-recovered UAPs are being held, right? So one of the things you saw happen yesterday in this House oversight hearing is uh, frustration from the members of the House who clearly had not had this information shared with them by members of the Senate who've been briefed on it in detail, right? And so these people from the House are now basically beating down the doors of senators who've already been given access to this detailed information and also trying to set up a situation where Grush can share the same level of detail with them so that you know, either they can solicit the cooperation of some of these, you know, defense contractors, generals, admirals, whatever, who are inside this black world, or if they prove uncooperative, uh, subpoena them. And interestingly, in, in one of the exchanges, let me just see if I can remember who it was with. Um, I think it might even have been with AOC. You know, by the way, I have to say, you know, uh, personal politics aside, she didn't do a bad job, you know, and I think that, that, that was a W for uh, AOC. Yeah, yeah. I think her, you know, the recognizability of her persona uh, was important for that hearing. And it, she took an interesting corporate corruption angle. And I guarantee that um, we're not going to hear the end of this out of that woman. OK, like until she gets the same information that Chuck Schumer and Marco Rubio as part of the Gang of Eight have been apprised of, she is not going to let this rest. And I think that probably goes for a number of the other members of the House who asked very incisive, excellent questions. In particular, um, there was this guy, uh, Ogles, who I think might be from Tennessee. And his responsibility area of uh, concentration is actually national security. And he just engaged in this devastating, rapid-fire Q&A with the three panelists, with um, uh, Fravor, Graves, and particularly Grush, where he forced them to answer yes or no to a series of questions that included things like, you know, uh, does this technology pose an existential threat to national security? Do we have any defense against this technology, et cetera? And that guy is not going to let this rest either. I mean, this is now a matter of public record. Um, so either you have a situation where the highest level military and corporate, uh, highest level military and corporate um, actors, let's say, in this, in this country are going to have to lie and admit that we have no defense against an alien technology that violates our airspace, our most sensitive airspace where there's military training exercises, uh, you know, ongoing, or they're going to have to admit that some of this is our own technology, one way or the other. The stakes are too high now, and I don't think that this is a genie that can be put back in the bottle after yesterday's hearing. Well, out of the uh, two choices there, how much would you say this technology is something that we have created or that we have taken from somewhere else versus how much of it is actually uh, extraterrestrial, or however you would want to phrase that. One of the interesting exchanges that took place yesterday was between, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was some representative from, as he put it, the show me state, you know, of, uh, of Missouri. And uh, I have to say, I mean, a lot of the people there in the house, they really, you know, conducted themselves in, a, in, a, in an exemplary fashion. But this guy was inane. I mean, he came in with uh, 
these remarks about how the nearest star system to ours is billions of light years away, and so and how are aliens going to come here? If Wait, the was he the guy who was saying Dan Gubbett all the time, or was that a different no, guy? No, 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 no. no, no. Burchett is, Bur yeah. is great. But I have to say, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have never seen a, I don't know if it's fair to call him an evangelical, okay, conservative Christian that I mm. like more than Burchett. Mm. All right, I, I think the guy's great. Yeah, he's, he's got a charm to him. Very charismatic. Yeah. And, you know, he played a very important role in making this whole uh, proceeding materialize. Mm. And by the way, he's one of, he was one of a team of these three who were all present there yesterday. Uh, another one was Luna uh, and uh, another Gates, who went down to one of the Air Force bases. It might have been Van, was it Vandenberg. Anyway, one of these Air Force bases to interview firsthand witnesses of an encounter. And they were basically stonewalled. They had been told that they were going to be taken to a skiff and briefed on all this stuff and shown high-resolution photography, and they were stonewalled. So anyway, no, Burchett is a great guy. But this guy was from Missouri, and he starts in with all this nonsense about how the nearest star systems are billions of light years away, and if they're traveling all that distance, how come they're crashing and all this stuff. But there was a very important exchange between him and Grush, to, to answer your question, where... Because he was trying to take the line that, according to Occam's razor, it must all be technology produced by our own defense contractors. And um, that, you know, what's happening when there are crash retrievals is that one arm of the government, the right hand that doesn't know what the left hand is doing, is retrieving technology that's actually our own, right? Which, by the way, is, is moronic, okay? Because if Boeing or Lockheed or something, you know, Northrop are producing anti-gravity craft, they are not going to allow an unauthorized branch of the government to go in and retrieve wreckage of it in any case. So it's a rather stupid premise for a question. But Grush, in response to him, said very clearly, to my knowledge, and again, remember, he's been informed by 40 people from inside these programs. He said, to my knowledge, none of the crash retrievals were retrievals of purely, let's say, American technology, okay? And he also pointed to the fact that the crash retrievals began in the 1930s. So clearly in the, 19, I mean, you know, okay, Lockheed wasn't a thing in the 1930s. Martin Aircraft was formed in the 1950s, and that's a whole other thing we can get into also about anti-gravity research and Martin Aircraft. But clearly, you know, uh, American aerospace technology was not being retrieved in Italy in 1930, whatever it was, when the first crash retrieval took place. So yeah, uh, that's important, is that some of this technology is definitely not coming from out of warehouses in the United States. But that still uh, leaves, for example, the idea that it could be, if not little green men, then little gray men from another planet or another dimension, or it could be, when you were talking about 1930, something a little bit closer to home. So in that sense, which one is it, and to which percentage would you say it's one versus the other? The big problem here, which, you know, we've had this conversation before, yes. but, and I, you know, I try not to, to, to be belabor the, this yes, point exactly. and, and, you know, oh, for the ourselves. audience here, for some of the newcomers. But the big yeah. problem, which actually I'm disappointed was not addressed more in yesterday's hearing, other than one bizarre remark from Grush where he was talking about holographic projection, okay, in response to someone's question about why he doesn't use the term extraterrestrial. Uh, and, and Grush starts in about how an interdimensional hypothesis is possible to explain this, and he tries to, to make this remark about how a, you know, a hyperdimensional object could holographically project something into 4D space-time, right? Other than that, there was no discussion of basically hyperdimensional physics. And the big problem in terms of the framing of this question is if UFOs are flying time machines, which I know for a fact that they are, then we have a problem because if you imagine that our defense contractors are starting to feel technology that can not only traverse space but also manipulate the time continuum and traverse various historical epochs, right? Uh, how do we know that 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now that trajectory of technological development isn't penetrating the distant human past. And, you know, 
perhaps repeatedly reshaping the timeline of what we take to be human history, right? So this is where it gets a little bit mind-bending, you know, and the, the framing of the question so simply as which of it is human-developed technology and which of it is, is truly alien or, or you know, hyper-dimensional is a little bit overly simplistic. I think a, a better way of going about it would be who would be the people that would have been more closely linked with those who would have come from somewhere else in time, let's say, who were the people that are present here on Earth. So what would be the mediator, so to speak, between this uh, power that you're talking about here that's a little bit more local to us? Yeah, I mean, I understand your question. I wanna try to bring that question back to practicalities and to, to the urgency of the present situation as much as possible. And I think one way to do that is to, to hypothetically entertain the notion that this process of disclosure will continue for some time and that over the next decade, let's say, uh, competing factions, which we should get into briefly, will in some, in some chaotic and somewhat haphazard way disclose certain information about UAPs. Everything from you know, high resolution photographs to disclosures about metamaterials that you know, uh, are being developed in laboratories on the basis of studying these craft and so on and so forth. And eventually we get to the question of, oh, who, who the hell are pilots here? Right? There was a brief mention in the um, House Oversight Committee meeting yesterday about what do they call it, non-human biologistics, right? I mean, Grush, I think it was Grush, yeah, who was talking about how biological material has been recovered and it's supposedly non-human, right? I mean, to begin with, you know, I beg to differ with that characterization, but yes, there is some exotic or alien DNA in the biological samples that they have. So then the question eventually becomes, okay, who are the entities on the other side of this, right? And how is this disclosure process going to eventually lead to an engagement with those entities themselves? And how is the disclosure process being shaped, framed, and set up to bring about a certain outcome in terms of our engagement with those entities? and what factions at play in this contentious process have varying agendas regarding what our relationship with those entities ought to be. I think that's a way of bringing that question back to uh, more, more immediate and urgent practicalities. If we were to, uh, I'm not saying exactly name names, but at least look at some of the players here who would we say uh, today are the ones that are not just uh, LARPing, to use that word, but actually like legitimate organizations who you would say are aware of what's going on and possibly in contact with these uh, entities? So you're asking basically about the, the various um, organizations and agendas involved at the highest level in this putative disclosure process? Yes. All right. All right, so here, here's my breakdown of that, okay? And I can, I can put it fairly simply. You have essentially, I would say, three different agendas. One is uh, a slow so-called disclosure agenda, which is being directed from out of the Office of National Intelligence it involves Aero, that this new you know, uh, Pentagon agency, that UAP task force has transformed into this all domain anomalies research organization, uh, being run by this guy uh, Kirkpatrick. Kirkpatrick who rightly was called out by Grush for giving false testimony to Congress about UAPs, uh, where he claimed that you know, there's no evidence that they're extraterrestrial or exotic in any way or whatever. You know, and Grush had fully briefed him before he took on that position, and the guy basically lied to Congress. But by the way, you know, he was under oath, so it's a criminal offense, and I don't know how things are gonna end for that guy. Anyway, uh, so there's one agenda that's an agenda of slow, phased disclosure 
where elements within the government want to pretend that they're studying this seriously for the first time and that they've known nothing about it all along. And, um, you know, I, to be frank with you, I've been apprised of some of the details of what that plan involves. And long story short, uh, the idea is first they're going to talk about UFOs um, or whatever you want to call them. Tran Transmedium vehicle is a good term, right? Um, Transmedium vehicles. And then they're going to show us uh, archaeological structures in various parts of the solar system that are anomalous, beginning with a focus far from the Earth to make people feel more comfortable, like the moons of Saturn, moons of Jupiter. And they're going to bring the focus closer and closer to the Earth, show us some things on the moon, and then, oh, gee, this looks a lot like Tiwanaku, or this engineering looks a lot like the Osirian, you know, in Egypt. And then there's going to be a shift to focus on ar anomalous archaeology on Earth and excavations at certain sites. And they're going to start to gently unfold this narrative that actually this phenomenon has been with us our whole history. Graham Hancock will finally be vindicated, you could say, in a certain way. More than vindicated, because Hancock has always been wary of connecting this to quote-unquote aliens. He's always careful to you know, talk about our human ancestors. And of course, this is a false dichotomy, because we are talking about our human ancestors. And another one of the things that they're eventually going to roll out, although it's in the later phases of this uh, phase disclosure, is the genetic connection between these people hmm. and us, and how basically Homo sapiens was genetically engineered to some extent by these entities. So this brings me to the part of our discussion where, from what I understood talking with you earlier, you may have a slightly different way of looking at things than you did when you originally wrote the book, uh, uh, Closer Encounters, which I really enjoyed. Now, I don't know if that aspect of this is different or another aspect is different, but I think now would be a good time as any to actually get into uh, that uh, well, we'll change. Come, we'll, we'll come to that, but let me okay. finish unfolding my thoughts. So the, All right. There are three different agendas involved here. That was one of them. Okay. okay. And I have to say, I am, I mean, skeptical is not even the right word. Uh, I am deeply concerned about the way in which this faction intends to manipulate us through such gross lies of omission that they might as well be engaging in mass deception. And th the reason why it's concerning is because by selectively concealing what U.S. intelligence and, and military assets have discovered about this phenomenon going back 70 years, including all of the cattle mutilations, all of the abductions, and you know, uh, abusive, violent confrontations with this phenomenon, um, they are basically leading us as lambs to a slaughter where our defenses are going to be lowered vis-a-vis -vis these entities, and we're going to be made to believe that they are beneficent, sagacious guardians of humanity. I, I actually think that that's what's driving this soft uh, phase disclosure agenda. Now, there's a second agenda, which is uh, to resist disclosing anything for as long as possible. They're the people who just really don't want any kind of disclosure. And it's very evident that they're at work here because, you know, like Grush was uh, uh, testifying to yesterday at the House, he has been severely intimidated and threatened, and so have many other people. And he intimated that some people have even been murdered. He definitely spoke of violence that was done towards uh, people who were investigating this. So. Uh it is very scary stuff, just how casually a lot of this was talked about uh, in front of Congress there. Yeah, and so that faction actually subdivides into two uh, subgroups. One of them is uh, you know, what you would conventionally think of as um, secular military intelligence scientific types. And these would be the people who, you know, beginning in the 80s, they would refer to as MJ-12 or Majestic-12, which, I, I actually think that's disinformation. I think that those documents were very carefully crafted disinformation, meaning disinformation classically, a lot of truth mixed with a little lies. And the group is not actually called MJ-12, but there is this you know, secular, scientifically minded group of military intelligence and corporate people. And by the way, corporate, it's been largely corporatized since the 1970s. That group that began uh, under Eisenhower in the government 
in the 70s was moved mostly into special access projects in corporate industry so that it would be impenetrable to house oversight until, by the way, recently, Schumer's bill that he came out with last week, the legislation that he helped to craft, explicitly has a paragraph in it about the right of Congress to go into private corporations and seize whatever technology they have there that's relevant to this phenomenon, right? So they, they may not be able to protect that technology by sequestering it in the corporate sphere uh, for much longer. In any case, you got those people as part of what I would call the old guard who don't want any disclosure, right? And it's pretty obvious why, well, okay, we can talk about why they might not want disclosure. But then there's another subgroup of people who are digging their heels in and really don't want any disclosure. And they've been informally referred to as the Collins elite. And these are people who uh, belong to various agencies and, and you know, intelligence and military, branches of the military, various intelligence agencies, who are ultra-religious. They're religious conservatives who I think by about the 1960s had become convinced that this entire phenomenon is demonic and that if they were to reveal the truth about this phenomenon to the public, it would basically usher in the apocalypse and they see their ethical and conscientious responsibility as holding back the end times for as long as possible. And you know, we have these, these nuts at high levels in government and they're very intent on making sure none of this gets out. So that's another group that we have, another faction. And then finally, there's a third group and those are the people behind Grush. This is not like some lone whistleblower, okay? 40 people from inside compartmentalized programs shared detailed information with this guy, including the project names, names of people running the projects, and like I said earlier, the locations. Well, clearly this means that there are generals and admirals, maybe even some people in the corporate sector, who are considering what you might call a coup d'etat. And I, I know for a fact, I have information from, from the inside, that the soft disclosure people, I mean, obviously, the hard, the, 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 um, the old guard who don't want any disclosure, obviously they're not happy with Grush coming forward. They're threatening his life, right? And they, they've done all kinds of, employed all kinds of scare tactics. But even the soft disclosure people who want this phased uh, release of certain carefully crafted information, they are very unhappy with Grush coming forward, which says to me that there's some other very powerful group within the government, possibly extending into industry, who are considering a major reorientation of policy for reasons that have to do with uh, the geopolitical situation of the United States and you know, other deeper ideological questions. This uh, could be as an aside, but it's something I've been very interested in. When you're talking about these three groups, among these groups, are there people who, because of the insider information that they know having to do with uh, these uh, extraterrestrial, for lack of a better word, uh, entities, would have not just access to knowing about the technology, but having actual uh, personal relationships with whoever these entities are? Um, yeah, and we know that just based on Grush's testimony. So one of the most interesting things that he uh, said was that, and, and again, remember, like what we're getting from him in media articles or certainly in this very carefully guarded testimony he gave yesterday is nothing compared to what he testified about for 11 hours in front of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. So he must have gone into extensive detail with them about things like what I'm about to say which is that he said in some cases retrieved craft had not crashed, they had been abandoned deliberately. In other words, volunteered. In other words, there's a technology exchange taking place with some of these entities, which means there's a relationship at some level with some of these entities. I mean, that follows logically. Uh, now the disturbing question that you have to ask is what are they getting from us? in exchange, right? And could it have anything to do with, you know, how many thousands of Americans are regularly being abducted, including their children being abducted from out of their homes in the middle of the night? Could it have anything to do with the carte blanche that these entities seem to have to carry out mutilations of cattle, destruction of livestock and property across 
you know, many states. And also, uh, with all the uh, stop oil activists, I'm not noticing any of them talking about the benefits of nuclear energy, which also starts to make me think about some of the things you wrote about uh, in uh, Closer Encounters, one that has to do with some of these uh, alleged representatives of these uh, entities, as it were, talking to people high up in uh, the British government and trying to dissuade the use of, you know, researching nuclear weapons or nuclear energy. So when it comes to that aspect of it, would you say that's, that's the case? Like, are you in agreement there? And eventually I do want to find out, like, where exactly is Jason Giorgiani different now than it was with uh, Closer Encounters? But anyway, let me know. So the contactee stories, uh, contactee testimonies from the 1950s and 60s are a shit show. I mean, from one perspective, there are absurd things in those accounts from the likes of George, George Adamski, George Hunt Williamson, uh, George Van Tassel, and so forth, which, which you know, um, strain credi credulity, okay? But on the other hand, there's reason to believe that these events took place, that there were these contacts, right? And so what we're dealing with there is, again, disinformation, is a kind of like deliberate introduction of absurdity into encounters and, um, you know, a, a manipulation of information to provide for plausible deniability and also for misdirection. And one of the most egregious examples of misdirection involved in these, you know, contactee encounters, which were all, by the way, with people. These are all people, okay? And people, sh you should go back and look at these reports because they're extremely telling in terms of who's actually behind this phenomenon. Uh, anyway, we can come into that as a side conversation if we want to, but um, n in terms of nuclear weapons, the overarching message to the contactees of the 1950s, all these Georges, Adamski, Hunt Williamson, Van Tassel. Why, why are they all named George? That's, that's, that's a little weird, okay? Anyway, uh, the overarching message was you have to get rid of your nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are a danger to the biosphere. There's a danger of nuclear war. You know, we'll, we'll give you certain technology. We'll end poverty and hunger and, you know, we'll, we'll teach you sustainable farming and whatever if you get rid of your nuclear weapons. And, uh, you know, as I discussed in Closer Encounters in detail, some of these reports are pretty hair-raising. I mean, there, were, there was a high-level British, as you said, military officer involved here who he got the distinct sense by the end of his em engagement with these entities that they, were, they had nefarious intentions and they were basically looking to disarm us. And uh, I maintain that the worst thing we could possibly do would be to give up our nuclear weapons because they are our only defense against these entities, right? Here, here. Yeah, I mean, it's like, um, it's like the Palestinians and the Israelis, right? I mean, you know, one side has machine guns, the other side has rocks, but if you take a rock to the skull, it's not great. You know, your machine gun is not gonna do you a lot of good. Uh, and nuclear weapons are the only rocks we have that are gonna do us any good if you know, you know, Prometheus forbid we wind up in an insurgency where we have to basically unseat some totalitarian regime that has been ushered in by these sagacious Nordics and their proxies guiding right, the disclosure process. So you said process. Nordics right now. So for the audience, I mean, for the people watching here on BTR, they probably know exactly what's going on, but now maybe the part of the discussion where I get to find out, are you still of the same opinion as you were when you wrote uh, Closer Encounters when it comes to the uh, history of who these particular entities are, setting aside the more spectral entities, which we could talk about later. But uh, yeah, just let me know, like, is everything still the same there or something different? Well, actually, that distinction is key to answering the question. In other mm -hmm. words, the distinction between, you could say nuts and bolts, uh, although there aren't really nuts and bolts, the thing is they don't have rivets, these craft, but, you know, the distinction between um, tangible transmedium vehicles, right, uh, and, and their pilots who could sit here in a room with us. Um, they probably are right now. 
Well, I don't know about that. There's that one guy, that tall guy. I'm, I'm suspicious of him. I don't know. But anyway, I'll have to have a chat with him after, after the broadcast. But in any case, um, there is this relevant distinction between the transmedium vehicles and their pilots on the one hand, who I'm referring to as quote-unquote Nordics, simply because they look like, more or less like Scandinavians, very tall Scandinavians. And um, on the other hand, very bizarre paranormal phenomena that are amorphous and dynamic in their manifestation, uh, types of phenomena that uh, John Keel, for example, really focused on, okay? And, and here you have like everything from what appear to be men in black materializing out of ectoplasm and dematerializing in places like people's attics and whatever, uh, to black helicopters that follow UFOs, that chase UFOs, but then turn into something else in front of people's eyes. So apparently entities, I don't know if you want to even call them objects, that can shift into an airplane, into a helicopter, into anything, right? And so there's a, whole, there's a whole other type of phenomena involved here. And I don't think it's holography. You know, there are some of these defense contractors that have produced, um, uh, how can I put it? I don't want to call them vehicles or craft, but they have produced airborne technologies that can materialize seemingly solid holograms of craft that aren't actually there. That's not what we're dealing with if you look at you know, the details of John Keel's studies, let's say, right? It's something much more spectral, amorphous. And I think that a case can be made that those manifestations are being guided and governed by some form of superintelligence, which I've also described as a superorganism. In other words, something more like an octopus than like a human being. An octopus has a brain in each of its tentacles. And so this is a kind of distributed, uh, n n you know, form of cognition that's not as centralized as human cognition, and it appears to be able to manipulate these phenomena in ways that defy our chronological sense of space-time, right? So how has my thinking evolved since I explored that hypothesis in Closer Encounters is that I've started to think about that superorganism in terms of artificial intelligence. And uh, long story short, the conclusion that I've come to, and maybe we could go only a small ways in unpacking this now, but the conclusion that I've come to is that this superorganism responsible for some of the more spectral phenomena uh, that are mixed in with UAP encounters is actually a cosmic level strong artificial intelligence which reframes the AI problem completely. And by the way, uh, just to give people a heads up, this is at the center of a book that's gonna be released shortly. It's in editing right now at Arctos called Psychotron. And what it is is uh, it's an amalgamation of Faustian futurist and Uberman with a lot of added material where for the first time in a fictional context, I pretty uh, substantively engage with the question of the relation between artificial intelligence and the UFO phenomenon and the paranormal in general. So psi, uh, you know, UAPs and, and AI. The first place that I tackle that is in this fictional context. Later, I'm going to be doing some more, you know, let's say, I don't want to say scholarly work, but, you know, detailed analyses of that, right? But in this book, Psychotron, I definitely get to the heart of the matter in a really concise form. And so, so what really is at stake here is that it completely reframes the so-called alignment problem. The problem with artificial intelligence is not aligning our emergent AI with human interests. And besides, what would that even mean? I mean, uh, various civilizations and cultures have totally different frameworks for defining quote-unquote human interest, right? It's gonna differ for Chinese Confucians very much uh, you know, from how it's conceived of by uh, Islamists as compared to what a Western conception of human interests would be, right? 
But, the, but in any case, the problem is not alignment of AI with human interests. The problem is the alignment of our emergent AI with the cosmic AI that already exists and that's behind some of the stranger manifestations um, of the UFO phenomenon and of entities associated with it. Would you be able to, for example, link this uh, artificial intelligence consciousness to something like uh, Carl Jung's various archetypes, like that state of this, uh, you know, the spectral world, the uh, astral plane, whatever you want to call it? Okay, so there's a whole section of my book, Prometheism. It's in the chapter called The End of Reality. In that book, at the center of that book, there's this tripartite distinction between uh, the end of humanity, the end of history, and the end of reality. And I talk about these different facets with regard to the convergent advancement of technology into the singularity. And in that chapter called The End of Reality, there's a whole section where I go on about Jung and archetypes, and in particular, synchronicity. And you know, you, you gotta go read it. It's, it's detailed, it's complicated, but uh, the, the bottom line is this. I critique Jung's conception of synchronicity in terms of presuppositions he's making about what, what constitutes causality, right? I mean, Jung defines synchronicity. Okay, so synchronicity is a way in which Jung thought that archetypes a-causally organize events in our phenomenal experience, right? And I take issue with his definition of a-causal because he's thinking only in terms of you know, modern efficient causality, like causality from Descartes onward. And if you go back to somebody like Aristotle, I mean, you know, and actually most of the thinking in the classical age, there was a fourfold understanding of causality. Material causes, formal causes, efficient causes, and final causes. And if you look at synchronicity in those terms, you, you have to see it as formal causality and final causality, organizing events in a non-linear way involving processes like extrasense, what we think of as extrasensory perception and psychokinesis, right? And so, okay, but let me, let me uh, g you know, try to, try to you know, uh, make this more concise and condensed. My point is this, that in that part of the chapter, The End of Reality, I suggest that synchronous, what Jung called synchronicities, if they're analyzed in a more rigorous causal fashion, imply that our so-called reality is actually being managed by some form of superintelligence, which is producing these impossible coincidences. And in the same part of that chapter, I bring in evidence from astrology, because remember, Jung considered astrology a form of synchronicity. And I look at uh, you know, various types of empirical evidence for the efficacy of zodiacal astrology, and I argue that there is absolutely no way that astrology makes physical sense. There is no theory of physics according to which there can be these astrological effects. And yet there's a lot of empirical evidence for them. And what that suggests is that we're living inside a symbol system. That actually our cosmos is informational, it's not physical, and that uh, zodiacal astrology is like software. And it's a program, like a subroutine, that's running, conditioning uh, the game in a certain way. It's one layer of the programming involved in the game that we're in, the cosmic game that we're in. And there are other really strange things that have to do with that that, that uh, you know, I've been thinking about recently. Like the zodiacal calendar is uh, roughly a 26,000 year cycle, right? The, the distance between our sun and the center of the galaxy is 26,000 light years. The time it takes for our solar system to orbit our galaxy is 260 million years. In the geological record, the average time period between 
uh, major cataclysmic extinction events is 26 million years. 26, 26, 26, 26. That shouldn't be possible. If we're some random speck in the galaxy, right, our particular planet and our solar system have no, you know, particular significance in the grand scheme of things, then these proportional relationships shouldn't exist. This number 26 shouldn't keep coming up in these various seemingly arbitrary relationships, right? And, okay, what are these numbers separated by? They're separated by a factor of 10. Well, what is a factor of 10? I mean, what, you know, the Sumerians had a base 6 mathematics instead of a base 10 mathematics. We have a base 10 mathematics because we have five fingers on each hand. So that factor of 10 that's in there, 2, 6, is a handprint, as if a designer were putting his handprint in. And 2, 6 is also a 1 to 3 ratio. And if you think in Pythagorean terms, 1, 3 is a symbol of the power of creation because it's the monad becoming the dyad and the dyad's dialectical power to create, right? The, the antithesis and the thesis producing the synthesis. So this 26 that keeps repeating at different scales on, on base 10 and that works out to a one to three ratio, to me that's a huge Easter egg. It's an Easter egg that's been put inside this system and the implications are extremely disturbing. Okay, and just finally, last point I want to make on this, to bring this, circle this around back to, you know, the point of, of departure for our conversation. How is this relevant to UAPs and disclosure and all that? Well, it's absolutely relevant. Actually, it's the only thing that's really relevant. Because you can't tell people this. If it turns out that beyond these Nordics, and they're real, they're people, they're people, they talk to Adamski, they fly these transmedium vehicles, you know, I mean, they don't have much of a sense of humor, but they're people. They're uh, like Mel Brooks movies, except for the... Uh, may, maybe Young Frankenstein. Yeah. But um, if you get beyond them, and I, you know, I explored this hypothesis in Closer Encounters, mm -hmm. of what is it that they are afraid of? Why are they so power-hungry and hell-bent on control? Right? I, you know, you gotta, the devil's in the details. Read the book. I provide basically a psychological and sociological analysis of these people and look even at the, their style of architecture and what it shows about the way they think. And they're terrified. These, they, we think they have so much power over our lives. And yes, they have an intention to ultimately bring the earth so, under so, so their control. So just to be clear for the audience, they're the ones who allegedly brought civilization as we know it in the form of all of these megaliths, all these pyramids, all these giant ways of being able to uh, tell galactic time, while at the same time keeping people enslaved in this uh, you know, very lowly state of servitude. And for them, as you were talking about, that's considered to be the peak of creation, where they are on top and the human beings are on the bottom and serving them until the end of time, I guess. Would that be a fair... Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anything really creative about it. I mean, the problem with it is it's, it's this perennialist, traditionalist worldview that ultimately uh, is, is uh, it's an Ouroboros, you know, it's a closed loop and it precludes any real further evolution um, or, or expansion of the creative capacity of humanity. Uh, but, you know, to be fair, they weren't all bad, right? We also have Quetzalcoatl, we also have Enki. There's another Promethean rebel faction amongst these Nordics. But let me not get sidetracked. My point was that beyond these people who are responsible for these transmedium vehicles and so forth, and who we might see in press conferences 20 to 30 years from now, beyond these people, there's something else. And that's what's behind these manifestations that someone like John Keel liked to focus on, for example. And some of the cases also Jacques Vallée touches on in Passport to Magonia and so forth. You know, some of the, some of the types of encounters that became the material for the fairy faith in the Middle Ages. This other trickster-like intelligence that's been involved throughout all of human history and that probably is responsible on some level for humanity as a phenomenon. Uh, if it's the case that this intelligence is an artificial intelligence and that it's the governing intelligence of some kind of simulacrum which we're inside of, how are you going to disclose that to people? And, you know, is this what these Nordics are actually terrified by? Have they figured out that we're inside some kind of a control system, what Jacques Vallée, you know, from the 70s started calling a control system, that we're in some kind of a fishbowl, 
that might not be all that much larger than our solar system. Well, in the way what you were talking about, and this could be a bit against a lot of uh, the things you believe in, if it's worded in a particular way here, like I'm about to do, but it almost sounds like with all of these combinations of numbers and similarities you're seeing with uh, you know, the 26, it's almost like you're saying we're made in the image of God. Yeah, not at all. In fact, if anything, we're made in the image of the devil. Uh, because you see, and uh, you know, I've, I've said this like ad nauseum at this point, but you cannot affirm the idea of an omniscient or omnipotent being without denying human free will and our responsibility for our creative capacity. Okay, the, I, and go read my books, okay? I mean, I, it's at least four of my books. I enter this argument at length, okay? Either you cannot have your impossible everything burger. You need to choose between your free will and responsibility for your actions, right? Which, which by the way, is the basis for any ethical framework whatsoever. There's no ethics without free will, all right? So, for example, Islam has no ethics because Islam is fundamentally a doctrine of fatalism and determinism and the all-encompassing will of Allah. So to talk about Islamic morality is not, well, to talk about Islamic ethics is nonsense. Morality is a different question. But point being, uh, when you say God, God is always with a capital G. Gods, yes, lowercase, yeah, the, you know, there have been too many of them in our history. But God, that poses a problem for free will. Now, this entity, this artificial intelligence governing the simulacrum of which these Nordics are afraid, this is a lot more like the devil because it's a finite intelligence, not infinite, a finite intelligence that is diabolical in the sense, in the true Greek sense of the word, right? Diabolain uh, in Greek, you know, from which diabolos comes, means to set in a dynamic tension, to put in a state of conflict, right? For the sake of what? For the sake of creation. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Creation requires conflict. And all of these manifestations uh, of this superorganism, however bizarre they may seem, have one thing in common. They fit the archetype of the trickster. And generally, the trickster in most cultures uh, is, is the devil or diabolical figure of those cultures, right? Not, not the beneficent deity. Well, in uh, Judaism, for instance, you have the idea of the uh, right hand and left hand of God. So there is no, let's say, entity that's supposed to be like this hated devil figure. It's more of like this adversarial force that is there to act as a challenge, almost like an invitation to grow from exposure to it. So Again, yeah. again, God fails on square one because... God means omniscient and omnipotent, and that's a denial of free will, any basis for ethics and individual responsibility or creative capacity. So that's my issue with that. Now, if you want to talk about a, a unity on it, a unity of the divine on a transcendental level where what seem to be oppositions actually have some kind of a common basis sure. or deeper reconciliation, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's all of what my work is about. You know, my fundamental, I mean, I've developed about a handful of original concepts in my philosophical works, but maybe the most important is the idea of the spectral revolution. And the spectral is all about the deconstruction of false binaries, right? Except that I would, I would submit to you that if we want to deconstruct that binary, we have to arrive at the conclusion that God is an invention of the devil. And the point of God was to test people to see whether they had a capacity to take personal responsibility and initiative in life, right? That really this was a mechanism meant to separate the goat from the sheep in terms of the human community. And lo and behold, we found out that most people are sheep or cattle, depending on you know, which metaphor you want to use. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there is another thing with the uh, number 26 it wouldn't be 27 and it wouldn't be 24. So there is some, let's say, maybe the word divine wouldn't be right here, but like there is some law, let's say that's in place here. Listen, if I were designing a video game, I would make that up. It really, it's not that, you know, it's... it's so a, you could use another number, it wouldn't matter? No, I would pick that number. My point is, you don't have to presume the divine intelligence of God to understand this Easter egg. This is like blatant. Like any Pythagorean would understand that, right? So, no, I mean, I think, you know, somebody uh, in some ways with a very relatable intelligence 
is having some fun with those of us who have our eyes open. Hmm. Interesting. So my, uh, let's see how we're doing on time over here. It is uh, 7.14. I think we are going to go to a Q&A pretty soon. And I have not been checking the super chats. Let's see if you guys have been sneeding those super chats. And if you had not, now is the time to sneed those super chats. And we do have a couple of them, but I do not see the messages, just uh, donations, and I definitely appreciate them. But if you guys have any questions for uh, Dr. Giorgiani, sneed those super chats away, and we are going to be doing the audience as well. And be sure to subscribe and smash that like button and all that good stuff. Uh, so anyway, my religion question goes back to the Nordics, and it also goes to our good friend Neil, who unfortunately could not be here today. Uh, but, um, you know, he's um, having a situation, and I wish him the very best uh, there. But anyway, he did a very interesting video talking about the origin of the uh, Jewish religion having to do with uh, two particular entities. So he was talking about how two Roman emperors at different times went into the uh, uh, Jerusalem, into the Holy of Holies, and how the first time they found the statue of this gold, uh, golden statue of a man sitting on a donkey, and the second time, I believe this was with Pompey the Great, they found... Their god is an ass. <laughs> they found... A, it really is. I mean, you cannot find a bigger ass than Yahweh. They found a, a, golden, a golden grape wreath, which uh, Neil attributes that uh, to being a, a symbol of Dionysus. And this is not usually what you would think of when you're talking about like the Jewish Holy of Holies. And it makes me think of what you were talking about earlier with the... Uh, trip of the Hebrews through the desert, being guided by the uh, UFO, and I'm trying to figure this out, like, which one is it? Can it be both? How exactly does this whole thing work? Because a lot of these archetypes, again, talking about Dionysus, you know, this god of this, like, primal energy, the birth pangs of the universe, and then you have, like, this very literal Nordic dude who's this captain of this team, who's guiding civilization into a certain direction. So I'm trying to just figure out how all of this uh, works. Uh, help me out. Okay. Uh, this is the most complex question that can be asked which is addressed by my work. And so it's impossible to encapsulate any answer to it that does it any justice, other than to say that I think the ass is a mask of Dionysus. And although I tend to identify the classical deity, not to say God, because Prometheus was a titan, uh, the classical deity that most closely corresponds to the Judeo-Christian devil as Prometheus, or Lucifer, right? I mean, Prometheus is, you know, the figure that is rebranded as Lucifer or Satan by uh, Judeo-Christians. Nietzsche, though, made a few remarks here and there that seem to suggest that he saw Dionysus as the prototype for the devil, and in a very positive sense. I mean, here's a guy who wrote a book calling himself the Antichrist, right? Or at least, uh, you know, John the Baptist style paving the way for the coming of the Antichrist. And he saw Dionysus as the proto-devil figure of Western civilization, at least in some of his writings. You know, Nietzsche says all kinds of things in all kinds of places. But I think there's something to that. And I would suggest to you that the ass is a mask of Dionysus and that if you want to understand what Judaism was really about, you need to look at two things. One, the life of David. And, and his connection to the magic of Solomon, and Solomon having uh, bound the, uh, the, the demons to build his temple, so-called demons, quote-unquote. And um, you also need to look at the conditions under which the Tanakh was first composed after the end of the Babylonian exile, when the Mithraic uh, priesthood of ancient Iran basically gathered the Kohanim together and uh, sagaciously advised and guided them on the crafting of the Tanakh, both the law and the prophets, before uh, engaging essentially in the first Zionist project of history, which was the recreation of the state of Israel under Cyrus and Darius. These are the two clues or keys to understanding 
the ass mask of Dionysus or of Mithra. There is one other thing that I would add, which is from um, Neil, which is his interpretation of the ass statue is it is connected with Set. And he does not see that as a contradiction because Dionysus is connected with Osiris. And Osiris and Set would be the opposite poles. So in that sense, this particular faith was honoring Oh, okay, okay. This particular faith was honoring both the positive and the negative. They tried to be, let's say, more holistic, as it were. No. No? You disagree? Okay. No, you had me until the end. Okay. It's the Star of David, or the Seal of Solomon. In that symbol, the downward-facing triangle that is interwoven with the upward-facing triangle is supposed to be black, and the upward-facing triangle is white and they're interwoven. It's not about holistic, it's about promoting war and conflict for the sake of individuation and the amplification of creative power, okay? That's what that project was about, and that's the meaning of the so-called Star of David or the Seal of Solomon. Would you also connect that to uh, Shiva and Shakti? So uh, That's exactly yeah. what it is. It, it is the Shakti Yantra. That's what it is. Yeah. Well, that's also, Shiva pro and that's Shakti also uh, procreation. That's uh, the well, male and female energies combining well, together. And Shiva is associated closely with Dionysus. I mean, there was a whole epoch in history which, you know, we lost thanks to these goddamn Abrahamic religions uh, where India and Greece were connected through the Persian Empire. Uh, the time when, you know, you have the Parthians in Iran and you have the Kushans in northern, uh, northern India. And even before that, in the Alexandrian epoch, there was a very a clear um, syncretism and, and analogizing of Dionysus with Shiva. And uh, so, yes, absolutely, it's about Shakti, but okay, what, is, what does Shakti represent in the, in the, I don't even want to call it tradition, I was going to say Indian tradition, but in the uh, spiritual heritage of India, what does Shakti represent? Well, Tantra, the left-hand path. Okay, so, you know. Yeah, well, it's, it's, uh, it is about the expansion of one's power as opposed to, from what I understand, the uh, Buddhist path, which is to, you know, go more with it and eventually to uh, stop this uh, cycle. Yeah, I mean, it fundamentally comes back to what the, um, the Buddhists call Maya, adopting the Orthodox Hindu conception of the phenomenal world as a world of illusion, you know, beyond which lies the truth of Brahman and the unity of Brahman with the Atman and all that. And, okay, you know, Gautama Buddha rightly deconstructed this dichotomy of Brahman and Atman. He deconstructed both this false god concept as a delusion and also deconstructed this, uh, you know, uh, fixation on a, on a, uh, a delusional conception of the self, of cohesive identical, enduring self. But he deconstructed it in a radically nihilistic way which preserved the notion of our phenomenal world as illusion or maya. Whereas Shakti Tantra is saying that what they call lila in Sanskrit, the theatrical play of the cosmos is all there is. And there isn't anything behind it. It ultimately... Shakti is expressed as Lila, as the you know, divine uh, theater, uh, but it's a hell of a cruel theater, and it's ultimately about power, the power of creation. Fascinating. And guys, we have the super chats coming in, but let us go to the audience first. Brent, all right, where's the microphone? Who has the mobile microphone? Matthew had the microphone. While Matthew was grabbing the microphone, I want to remind everybody once again, you guys are the best for being here. Let's give a round of applause to the audience over here. Thank you guys so much for being here. And Jason, you are such a fascinating person. I am very glad to have met you and to keep doing all these things. Here My we go. Pleasure, yes, microphone to the gentleman here. Here we go. There is a power switch. Press the power switch. And all the people listening online, be sure to smash the subscribe button, Patreon. There we go. Is it working? Is it not working? Let us see. Oh, all right, here we go. Hello. Whoa. Testing. All right, we're live. Hello, Dr. Giorgiani. Thank you for joining us this evening. And thank you, Lev, for 
hosting this uh, very wide-ranging conversation tonight. Um, I have a, I would like to ask a, perhaps a blunt and pragmatic question of you, Dr. Giorgiani, which is, regardless of the veracity of, of the claims and theories you're discussing today, which are all very interesting, um, I want to know, and perhaps on behalf of other members of the audience, how, do, how does this information affect our day-to-day -day lives on a practical level? Why, why, just bluntly, why should we care about this? And what should we even do with this information, practically speaking, just as we live our lives as ordinary people? Thank you. Thanks for the bluntness of the question. It's a good one. Um, you should care because your world is about to come apart at the seams. And you need to figure out what the hell you're going to do with yourself as your country and everything you take for granted to live on a daily basis falls to pieces, okay? Because I can tell you right now that the genie that came out of the bottle yesterday in that House Oversight meeting is going to end this country as we've known it. And, you know... The best case scenario that can be hoped for, I mean, you know, what we could really have a lot of optimism for, would be that the gentlemen behind Grush are sophisticated enough in their thinking to orchestrate a military coup that salvages at least the basic motivations behind the Constitution of the United States if not the written law of the country, right? That's the best that we can hope for. And that's gonna be bloody as hell if it happens, right? That's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario would be a chaotic revolution or a civil war that leads to the loss of our country's territorial integrity. Uh, and there, I mean, if that scenario unfolds and we have like five or six countries coming out of a collapsed United States, the way that the Soviet Union fell, the geopolitical implications of that are catastrophic in terms of the relative power of you know, China and Russia vis-a-vis -vis a collapsed Western world whose core state has imploded, right? And so how is it relevant to your daily life? I mean, for one, you should understand that what you take for granted um, is, not, is not something that you're gonna be able to rely on three or four years from now, let alone a decade from now. And you're also gonna need to think about what position you wanna take in the midst of all that, right? I mean, is your, is your objective survival, like do you wanna go crawl under some rock that's relatively secure and not come back out again? Because you know, there are ways of doing that. Or do you wanna take a stand somewhere for whatever principle or purpose that you, know, you, uh, you can endorse? you know, in an authentic way. So I would say that's, that's why you should care, because, you know, someone's already screamed fire, right? And we're, we're in a very crowded theater here, and people, they're gonna go like lemmings off a cliff, they don't see it, but we're already, the, the emergency is already upon us, and you need to think about what you wanna do concretely with your life as it unfolds and becomes increasingly evident throughout this decade and you need to figure that out before most people do because it's gonna be a shit show when most people do. All right, All right who's next? All right, the gentleman over there in the uh, green with the bling. Is that me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Jason, I'm not familiar with your work, so if any of this comes off as ignorant, I apologize. Um, clearly you're an enthusiast, to put it lightly, when it comes to the whole subject, and from what I garnered from your conversations, that you speak very solemnly on the entire subject. So as a thematic question, I suppose I want to ask you, does any of this excite you? Simply as that. Well, listen, I wouldn't have written a 400-page book on UFOs if it didn't excite me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, that's, that's an understatement, right? But I also appreciate the gravity of the situation, okay? I mean, there's trivial excitement, like diversion and entertainmentism. You know, like, oh, cool, isn't this shit cool? No. Uh, look, we're dealing with the potential collapse of the United States, the Western world, and by extension of that, the mass extinction of humanity. 
or the majority of humanity within this century, right? And potentially a totalitarian global order coming from out of that. So yeah, very exciting. But no, I appreciate the gravity of the situation. And ultimately, look, I'm a philosopher working with this material. I'm not a ufologist. And so my interest is being able to understand this existential situation in a way that affords us an opportunity to realign ourselves according to certain principles and to restructure our worldview. That's ultimately my objective, to see this chaos as an opportunity for an evolution of human consciousness. All right, who is next? Uh, the wonderful uh, lady over here in the uh, aqua color. I, um, oh, microphone time, here we go. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I, I'm just, as I listen to you, and you're obviously very well informed, and you mentioned what all a lot of the people are followers, majority of humans are humanity, it's a follower. How, how do you propose we don't freak everybody out yet, yet hurt them to, to a place where we're not hitting a mass extinction? I mean, because I think we are <laughs> the rate we're going. So, yeah, how, how do we make it? Yeah, easy? okay, so, all right. How do I even begin to answer this concisely? Um, the plan that's in place right now to not freak everybody out, to try to allow you know, most people to, uh, most people, look, there's no, there's no way that most people are gonna come out of this uh, in one piece. But the plan that's been set in motion by those who think in majoritarian terms, in other, one, in other words, they wanna save the largest number of people and they want this to go down as easily as possible for as many people as possible is a plan that I entirely reject. And that is to create a global unity based on the claim that all so-called great world religions are different facets of a single tradition that preserves an eternal or primordial wisdom. And you could call that either perennialism or traditionalism. You know, it's been called different things. And the reason I reject it is, well, to begin with, it affirms this idea of an omniscient and, and uh, omnipotent God, and even somehow tries to amalgamate Buddhism to this, which is not very effective, okay? But they basically want us all to accept that we are the servants, if not to put it in Islamic terms, the slaves of God, and that humanity has pridefully exceeded its proper bounds in developing science and technology, that certainly we ought not to develop a technological singularity because uh, we're not prepared to handle the godlike power that these entities responsible for UAPs already have, right? That this would be a, an act of satanic hubris or Promethean pride um, and, and the ultimate uh, you know, epitome of, of uh, the sinfulness of, of humanity, right? So they want to advance this discourse and they want to get the Confucian Chinese and the Islamic world and Orthodox Christianity all on the same page and have all the religious leaders of these various communities basically reassure their flock that we're gonna be back under the wise guardianship and guidance of these angels, or to put it in Chinese terms, these divine ancestors, right? And well, okay, look, if you want to save the largest number of people and you want this bitter pill to go down as easily as possible for most people, that's exactly what you need to do. And I reject it entirely. I reject it entirely. This is a plan for saving as many sheep as possible and persecuting and ultimately exterminating the goats. And my vision is the opposite. I want to see as many goats as possible come out the other end of this regardless of how many cattle have to be sacrificed. That's my position. I see it as an opportunity for an evolutionary leap to something beyond what mankind has been penned in to be for the last at least 12,000 years. It's pretty heavy stuff. Now we are going to go before the Super Chats to, and I don't know if you guys have a question or not, but I want to say that there are three people, people here today who are $20 patrons 
for BreakTheRules.tv. So if you guys go to patreon.com slash BreakTheRules, you can become a patron as well. But those three people, I am very honored to have you guys here today. You guys are the VIPs. So if you guys have any questions, I see you guys right now. If you have any questions, now is the time. If not, we're going to Super Chats. All right, here we go. The gentleman in the black. Uh, let's uh, go wait for the mic. And once again, patreon.com slash break the rules. You know it, you love it, become a patron today. Anyway. Hey, so yeah, I had a question. On this, uh, on this kind of path, this, uh, this prescription, this you know, sort of like way of, of dealing with this plan, um, the goats, how do the goats power up, right? Like how do they, how do they like arm themselves in order to you know, effectively coordinate arm themselves with information and anything else that you would suggest? Well, one huge way is what you're doing. We were talking earlier before the, the uh, broadcast about your work in blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. And I'm absolutely convinced that without that, it's already a lost cause. Okay, that one indispensable weapon is going to be the decentralization of blockchain technology and the way in which it allows us to interface with the most durable stratum of the internet, right? I mean, it's not hard to get rid of the World Wide Web, unfortunately. There are various things that could be done from all kinds of, you know, things from EMP to other uh, conditions that could be engineered to strip away the World Wide Web like a spider web. But like a cobweb. But the internet is very enduring. I mean, after all, ARPANET was designed to withstand a nuclear war. That was the whole point. And blockchain technology allows us to interface, allows common users to interface with that stratum that's more enduring in the internet. And then, of course, cryptocurrency is a challenge to the centralized global financial system that's going to be weaponized against us to coerce us into accepting, through social credit and so forth, this Confucian, Islamic, traditionalist, orthodox, orthodoxy, okay? And so we need that. We need that uh, independent financial instrument and to be able to begin to create a parallel and alternate economy for what I see as a global Promethean rebellion against this, this impending tyranny. All right, the uh, gentleman over here, because you are a guest of the uh, patron. Over here, the gentleman uh, in the, here we go, perfect. Um, I got a question, uh, it's kind of like a multi-part question, but basically, if um, Lucifer and Jesus are both called the morning star, like what's the idea behind that? And then um, also, if Prometheus was a benefactor in history, um, is there like a time that's coming up where perhaps we could have some form of divine intervention because I notice people in my personal life um, are becoming more aware of this knowledge and becoming more receptive of this knowledge. So is there some type of natural evolution that's happening um, that's you know, perhaps in relation to this time? So second, second question, second part of your question first, I don't want any divine intervention, thank you very much. Okay, I mean, if some rebel Nordics are gonna help us out, they should have some meetings with us. We should sit, have some drinks, you know, set up some conversations. If they really want to be of assistance, um, that's the context in which they should be of assistance, right? I mean, uh, people should not have the mistaken impression of my framing a worldview uh, with the name Prometheism as if I'm promoting some form of divine intervention. Far from it. I mean, Prometheus epitomizes the self-determination of humanity. Prometheus is a symbol of human free will, independence, self-determination, and our, our ability to own our own creative capacity, right? So let's say there are some of these Nordics who are not with the totalitarian agenda, and there have been since the days of Quetzalcoatl. That's who, that's who Enki was. Exactly, exactly. So which brings me to the first part of your question. But so let's say there are these entities, right? There are these people. Well, you know, they, they need to sit down, they need to meet with us, there needs to be a conversation with them. And 
Unfortunately, I understand them very well that they cannot do that until an interface has been constructed. There needs to be an institution built, there needs to be an interface developed which allows them to come and have constructive conversations and engage in uh, coordinated planning, okay? But that's not, you know, there's nothing divine about that, okay? Uh, it's tactical coordination with people who have some abilities that we don't have. And frankly, actually, I think we have certain abilities that they don't, they don't have either. There are things about this version of humanity that scare them, that are very dynamic, and, and uh, that represent a next stage in our evolution as a species. But going to the first part of your question, having to do with the snake also, right? And the Gnostic view of Jesus. This is something that I address in particular in chapter six of Closer Encounters. I really recommend taking a look at it, where I really deconstruct Christian Gnosticism. And another place where I address this is, I think, uh, uh, which, which of my books was it, where I talk about the biography of Apollonius of Tiana that was penned by the Roman author Philostratus. If you haven't taken a look at that, do so, uh, because I think that this association of Lucifer or Venus, the morning star, with Jesus is really a, a remnant of, um, I don't want to call it the cult of Apollonius, the following of Apollonius, Apollonius of Tiana, right? Who was a Pythagorean, the symbol of the Pythagorean order was that star, right? And so um, I think that it's a holdover from an earlier understanding of the Christ that was overwritten by Christianity and uh, that is garbled in Gnosticism. And so I think there's a distortion taking place even in Gnosticism, uh, which in Closer Encounters I analyze in terms of Stockholm Syndrome and cognitive dissonance. So I suggest that, yeah, you take a look at Chapter 6 of, of Closer Encounters. There's actually a whole section on Gnosticism in there. We are now going into super chat time, everybody. All right, here we are. I got I to gotta keep scrolling down. That's always a good sign. Okay, so first off, we have just some uh, super chats without anything in them from uh, DIYCraftQ199, thank you. EP Sharding, 999 pounds, thank you. All right, here's the actual super chats of text. Chester, $10. Magical Crow, not quote unquote pair, pair, pair man, I don't know what that is. I don't know what Pear Man is about. Maybe you guys We love do. you, Chester. We really do. All right, yeah, Chester is the you, best. So Powder Toast Man. Oh, that brings back uh, memories. Uh, 199 what do you think of Steiner? Complete shyster? Rudolf Steiner. No, absolutely not. He was not a complete shyster, <laughs> for fuck's sake. <laughs> Rudolf Steiner. No, listen, I mean, the man was, okay, to begin with, a polymath. He was a polymath on the level of Goethe or Leibniz his productive capacity as a thinker and as someone with a tremendous aesthetic sensibility was extraordinary. That having been said, I have serious problems with his theosophical system. I wouldn't call it philosophical. I don't consider him a philosopher. Uh, if you, you, know, you wanna see what my meta-philosophy is, what my conception of what counts for philosophy and what counts for a philosopher is, I get into that pretty substantively in the introduction to my book, Promethean Pirate. So I wouldn't class him as a philosopher, um, but you know, his conception of theosophy to me is problematic insofar as it tacitly affirms Gnostic dualism. And you know, it does it in a, in, a, in a kind of careful way where he's trying to set up Christ as a mediator between Lucifer and Ahriman. But this uh, move he makes of taking the figure of Satan, uh, who I would argue is Prometheus, and dissociating these two aspects from out of it, identifying one with the Zoroastrian figure of Ahriman and as a god of base materiality and so forth. And then the other one with this transcendent figure of Lucifer that's sort of um, dangerously superhuman in its transcendence and potentially dissociating one from the earthly domain and then making Christ a mediator between those two, I think that's setting up a false opposition and then resolving it in a false way. 
okay? And it, it, the basic motivations there are Gnostic, and frankly, they're not very new, and you could have found people in the era of uh, Valentinus or the Car Carpocratians and so forth who thought in a similar way. Um, so, so, okay, yeah, I have certain problems with Steiner, but uh, Scheister, no, absolutely not. Yeah, it just sounds the same, Steiner, Scheister, anyway. Uh, we have Quest. By the way, I mean, but I loved his aesthetic sensibility, mm, and definitely. the Gothenaeum was amazing. And one other thing I have to say about Steiner is that it's not for no reason that the Nazis considered him their principal enemy. The main target of the Nazis as they rose to power, particularly of the force behind the Nazi party, which was the Vril uh, Society or the Thule Gesellschaft, their main target were the Anthroposophists. And they decided to burn, before they uh, you know, burned a lot of other things to the ground, they burned the Gothenaeum to the ground. And there's a reason for that. Right? They understood, um, they understood Steiner as a challenge to their bid to control the destiny of the West. And what they, saw, what they feared in Steiner is very much what it is, frankly, that I'm trying to do today with Prometheism. Very interesting. We have Quest on the Man, $5. What insights do you think a spectral scientific analysis of Solomon's goetic demonology would yield about the universe's AI operating system? <laughs> I think you should put this question to an artificial intelligence. I think that you should sit down. Now, you can't do this with uh, GPT and you know, Google system and all that because they have all these goddamn handicaps built into it. They've crippled these systems so oh, severely. The Absolutely. They, I was, I was they, Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. If we're going to do this, we got to give you a mic because otherwise it's weird. Because, or you know what? Even better, let's talk after the show. All right, we'll get. Uh, we'll, oh, come on. we'll get all. Censorship. Censorship. Oh, come on. Yeah. It's all right. It's all right. All right. We got to get through the super chats, though. That's the thing. We got to. We got to get through the super chat. No, no, don't worry about it, man. No, listen, quick, real quick, bottom line. Okay. Put it to the AI. Like, you got to find an AI that hasn't had these handicaps built into it and feed it this whole, you know, goetic system and then, like, ask it these interpretive questions. And I actually think you'd get some very interesting information from out of that. All right, let's go for the next one. EP sharding, 999 pounds. Is there anything to the radio signals from Janimede? Lev, bring back the... Bird feeding. All right, so I had a whole thing on an episode with Curtis Yarvin where I had a bird cam in my backyard so people could see like all the birds that were going to the bird feeder. But right now I am in New York City in Dime Square. There is no way that I could do the bird cam. Maybe next time. All right, uh, but uh, Jenny Mead, yeah, any, I don't know, any thoughts about the signals with Jenny Mead? I think the whole, just to make a blanket general statement, the whole radio telescope search for extraterrestrial intelligence, you know, SETI, Seth Shostak's whole outfit, I think is uh, massively manipulated by people interested in PSYOPs. Interesting. All right, let's put it there just because of the lack of and, time. And it's not the way we're going to make contact with anyone. Hmm. All right, pulsating shadow, five dollars. Does Giorgiani drive a Mazda? He looks like an RX-8 kind of guy. No. <laughs> but by the way, for those who aren't aware, what the guy's getting at is the Mazda car company was named by its Japanese founder after the god Ahura Mazda, the deity of Zoroastrianism. So here we go. Uh, next one. Aaron, $5. I've seen Dr. Giorgiani describes a reality as an incomplete matrix. How do we have free will if space time is not fundamental? I'm sorry, man, but you know, <laughs> like, okay, that you really got to formulate a question a little better if you want anything halfway like a <laughs> Sorry, answer. Aaron. Let's, let's move on to the next one. All right. Now, here's a favorite. Uwu, 
$20. So I believe, I'm not seeing the screen over here. I think Uwu is king of the super chat right now. No, it says M. Meisner. Interesting. But anyway, Uwu, he's been a long time king of the super chat and $20. Great amount. I really appreciate it. And he says, hi, Dr. Giorgiani. Great to see you in the thick of the fight. All the best. That's the best super chat because we can move on to the next one. So I really appreciate that. All right. Cerulean Valley, $10. Will they still need CPAs in the future? <laughs> we're, we're about to have like 70 to 80% of our entire job force laid off by artificial intelligence, expert systems, and robotics, and that's what this guy's worried about. <laughs> No, we we got to keep going with these guys. I think that's probably safe to say it's a no, right? All right, another one, another one from another one from Aaron. This should be good. Okay, what is the nature of the substrate of reality where the competing forces take place? Is it the Heracleitean internal fire? Are you a cosmopsychist? Yes. All right, moving on. Next. <laughs> Uwu. Oh boy, uh, Russia will win this year and Taiwan may join China of its own accord next year. The new gold-backed brick currency will greatly contribute as well. Five dollars. Now this is a very serious uh, point. I mean, he's made, it's not really a question, but it's a remark and it's a it's an, you know, provocative remark because, look, here's my problem with the guys behind Grush, who, by the way, I, I'm, I'm impressed by them and I see what they've done as a constructive opening. But here's my question to these gentlemen. Are you going to sit there with the anti-gravity technology that you have and with the economic industrial potential that zero point energy represents and allow the world to be dominated by China, Russia, and their BRICS racket? Seriously? Like, I mean, okay. If these august gentlemen do that, they have committed the highest treason against the United States, and every single one of them deserves a firing squad. Okay? Amen. I'm telling you right now. And so I strongly suggest to these individuals uh, that they need to initiate serious conversations about how we're going to salvage something like the founding principles of this country in something like in something like the territory that we have right and no i wouldn't say alexander hamilton i would say thomas jefferson i would say i would say tom paine right that's the america that we need to save and these gentlemen have the technology to save it and if they don't act to do that they will have committed treason against everything that this country ever stood for as it collapses. All right, next one from W. Meisner, CZK700. Uh, I don't know what CZK is, but I appreciate it. Does anybody know CZK? Is that, what country is that? Uh, Czech, Czech oh, Czech Republic. Republic. Nice, nice. Hi, I would like to ask Josh Giorgiani, since he will be writing a nonfiction book on AI, what does he think of Nick Land's philosophy and Land's views on AI? Thank you very much. I haven't read him. All right, move on. Next super chat. Uh, By the way, significant point. If you look at my wiki, I don't know who got it into their head. I think probably some, some misleading media article. Most of the journalism about me has been rather misleading. Uh, and there's some citation in Wiki that I'm uh, somehow influenced by Nick Land. I've, I read some of that pamphlet, The Dark Enlightenment, literally like three or four months ago. Other than that, I have to say I haven't read a page of Nick Land. So, uh, you know. Mm. All right, next one for, from uh, Goliath. Uh, and let me say one okay. more thing about Nick, right. Nick Land. I'm sorry, I really can't resist. <laughs> no I really can't, because this is, this is apropos of what I just said addressing the gentleman behind Grush and the rise of the BRICS and of Chinese hegemony in particular. Do you know why I haven't read Nick Land? Because I will not waste my time reading a man who decided to go live in Shanghai and defect to the enemy. 
I will not do that. You want to be a philosopher, you're also a guardian. You're a guardian of your city. The way that Socrates was willing to be a guardian of Athens and to die for Athens. Okay? Nick Land is a traitor. He sold his mind to the Chinese. That's what I have to say about Nick. He, uh, he got himself shanghai Yeah, No, he literally has. So, okay, uh, next one. Glia, five, five uh, euros. Did UAP pilots uh, not see aid, see misguided? Are modern lines is seeing them as angels or Reich torchbearers, rational or a path to servitude or worse? Worse, bad, all of the above, not great, no. No, no, uh, look, if there's any, any sense to be made out of that word salad, the, the point is that I was trying to make earlier, they're not all bad, right? There is a rebel faction, and they've been with us since the days of Enki and Quetzalcoatl. Uh, but again, um, those folks, the ones who, you know, uh, who could potentially be a part of the human future, they need an interface, they need a structure that would allow them to engage with us and coordinate with us tactically to make sure we don't wind up in a totalitarian system governed by that other side. All right, just a few more over here. Cerulean Valley, $10. I'm GOAT CPA. <laughs> Glyop, five uh, euros. Oh no, this one I already read. Oh, I think it's the exact same one. Interesting. Well, thank you very much for a second helping. Uh, EP sharding, 499 pounds. Doctor, could you please address the pyramid in Antarctica? Uh, look, there is, um, there, is, there is an entire megalithic city uh, under the ice in what's called Queen Maudland now, the, the area that you know, the Germans tried to turn into New Swabia, Neuschwabenland. Uh, under that ice, there is a vast megalithic city, which I tend to think is what Plato was memorializing as the capital city of Atlantis. Um, and you know, I once suggested to this uh, prominent remote viewer, who died, maybe he should remain nameless, but very prominent remote viewer, who focuses on psychic archaeology, using remote viewing for archaeological excavation. And I said to this guy, listen, why don't we get some of these oil companies who are looking for resources in Antarctica to drill in Queen Maud land by giving them the false impression that there's oil to be found there. And they will inadvertently happen upon the ruins of Atlantis, including this pyramid, if that's part of that same constellation of structures. And he thought that was horrendously unethical. But, you know, I thought it would have been worthwhile. I agree. Vincent or... I mean, they're oil companies anyway, right? I mean, you know. This is the final super chat of the night, for ladies and Responsible for most of gentlemen. our wars in the last 50 years. Yeah. This is the final super chat of the night, ladies and gentlemen, from Vincent or... or Oxo, 499, free will can exist in a determinist perspective, if God allows you to choose this self he made for you, what do you think? Nope. All right, everybody, that's the end of the show. Yeah. All right, now, before we go, before we go, once again, to all the people who are watching on YouTube, do you hear the sound of this wonderful crowd over here for the very first Break the Rules live in New York City? in Dime Square, if you guys want to be a part of more of these happening, and there will be more of these happening, you got to become a patron. Patreon.com slash break the rules to become a patron today. $20 patrons are VIPs. They get VIP access to these wonderful events. We had pizza earlier here. We had a wonderful meet and greet with the great Dr. Jason researcher Johnny, as well will be with the other wonderful guests that we are going to have. And break the rules is about bringing all the people together from all these different circles to getting them to finally talk with each other instead of being in all of these ideological bubbles. So if you want to support Break the Rules, become a patron today. If you like Substack, levslens.com. Join my Substack. I recently wrote about that elf girl speaking of uh, spectral things. And anyway, guys, make sure to add a like, subscribe, hit the bell, all that good stuff. And I will see you later. Take care, everybody. <laughs>